spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Happy Aloha Friday. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. Of course, this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. And Ryan, today we are diving deep into the issue of rail. That's right. We're going to be bringing in someone who has uh, really dug in deep and knows a lot about the project that continues to stir debate within the community. Joining us now is Colleen Hanabusa, chair of the Hard Board. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Ryan and Yunji. Uh, let's begin and, and start off with uh, some of the headlines that we saw last week coming from mm -hmm. Mayor Blangiardi and his uh, you know, proposal to of where he believes that the rail line should end, saying that it should end in Kaka'ako rather than Ala Moana. Uh, what are the th your thoughts on this and, and what has been the discussion among the Heart Board about this new proposal? Well, you know, it's never been viewed as a proposal to end or to stop rail, which is somehow how it's evolved in the discussion. It's never been that. It's it's called the truncated project. In other words, the board, the mayor, and Hart's administration, everyone remains committed to the fact that the rail will get to Ala Moana. The question is, when do we have the money? As you know, the mayor's position has always been, we will build to as much money that we have. So right now, because of COVID, and now because of the inflation that we're seeing, especially stateside, and the fact that we have the Ukraine war and the cost of fuel and so forth, the, the issue is becoming, well, how much money do we have and how far can we go? So the tied into all of that is the fact that the FDA is requiring Hart and this well, technically the city and county of Honolulu, to come up with a recovery plan to show where and how this project will progress with the amount of funds that we have tied up as everyone knows, it's about $744 million worth of federal funds, which have not been released yet. So the discussion of Civic Center is because of the fact that with the estimates that we have, and remember, they're all estimates, because no one knows how much money we're going to have by the year 2030. But with the estimates that we have now, we know that uh, confidently, we can get at least to Civic Center. So to Produce that for the FTA uh, is what's going on now. The Heart Board has established what is called the PIG, which is a permitted interaction group. And we're developing a, a report for the rest of the board as to how we view the state of rail right now. And of course, the Heart uh, Administration will come out with a recovery plan that has to be approved first by the board and then by city council. So the ultimate decision maker on, on all of this will be the city council because they are, the city and county of Honolulu is the participant or the person who is signatory or the entity that's signatory with what we call the full funding grant agreement or the agreement with the FTA as to the heart project. <laughs> Now, we've talked for years, and hello to your, good morning to your dog. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm baby, um, doggy sitting today. Um, we've talked for years that, uh, that that the plan has always been all in Moana, that we have to get all the way there in order to the FTA to release that money. The mayor has said on this program that he did meet with the agency. Mm -hmm. He went to Washington, and he thought those meetings were quite productive. You're obviously very familiar with the ongoings in Washington. What is your take on what you know how the FTA will respond to this adaptation? We know that we want to get to Ala Moana eventually, but it seems like, at least for now, uh, it's Holly Kawila and South Street for for the foreseeable future. Well, you know, I'm not necessarily convinced that it's uh, that we are not going to find the the funds or have the funds available because if the federal funds are released, it affects things like bonding. It affects how much uh, we have to pay in bond costs 
uh, in the future. And remember now, the way this project is done is that at the end, which is projected to be 2030, uh, there'll be no, no bonds due, nothing. All the debt will be paid for. That's the way this is. And the other thing that I think we all tend to lose sight of is that when the city and county of Honolulu engaged in the whole process of should there be a rail project and so forth, you know, one of the things you heard in the beginning was LPA, the locally preferred alternative. So the locally preferred alternative is really UH Manoa. So what the um, uh, Ala Moana is to us has been defined by the city council is uh, a, a minimum operable segment. And that's something that, you know, it sounds like a whole bunch of words, but that's what that is. But the LPA, the, ulti the ultimate objective, which we sold the rail project as, is to UH Manoa. So what we are calling this leg so far is a truncated project, but not giving up going to Ala Moana. Ala Moana is the ultimate goal. And some people may say we're not going to get there or so forth, but I happen to believe that we are. Because think about it. Civic Center, Hale Kawila and South Street, is 1.25 miles from Ala Moana, the destination, that's the final station in terms of Ala Moana. There's only two stations between Civic Center and the end, which one is Ala Moana and the other is Kakako, which I think most of us think of as the Ross site. Those are, that's what it is. So the question is going to be, when we get to Civic Center, if this is uh, something that the FDA will agree to, and then release its funds, that it still, I consider it owes the project, then the question is going to be, okay, now, now that that's done, really, what do the projections mean? You know, we're coming off of COVID, and we're now looking at inflation, we're looking at uh, the whole concept of, Ukraine war, what is that going to do? But the, really, how are we as an economy rebounding? The major sources of income for the rail project is the general excise tax and, of course, the transit accommodation tax. And the more recent, we call it the city TAT, which is that 3% the city council uh, enacted, 50% of which in, a couple of, in two years will be for dedicated for the rail project. That funding source is in perpetuity. The TAT and the GET from the state legislature is really going to end uh, in 2030. That's 20, December 31st, 2030, which takes money actually into 2031. But that's what that looks like. So what do we believe, we the people of this state believe, is going to be our future economic growth? So right now, the, the, we are re-looking at our numbers because it's all projections past, past this month, technically, what we think we're going to get. And the uh, Department of Taxation has agreed with, the, with the, um, the HART staff that the growth is going to be about 5.83 into for GET into the future and 9.1 for TAT into the future. I'm sure you've had on this program the amazing projections that, for example, Council of Revenues has come up with. You know, they were 15% growth in our total revenue for the state for up to in January. And then in their March meeting, they were up 21%. So you can imagine in that short period of time, to the end, if they believe we're going to be 21% for the whole fiscal year, you're making up six percentage points of growth for the whole year in a period of four months. So in other words, the economic situation looks like it's really kickstarting. And of course, you see all the tourism numbers and the TAT numbers are huge, but the GET numbers and the, the, the council revenue is all revenues, but the GET numbers are amazing. So I do know from representations made by the Hart staff that the amount of money that we are now receiving from the state exceeds even the projections that we've had. So this is really what it comes down to. It's all it's going to come down to what the economy is going to look like. The Japanese tourists aren't back yet. So I'm sure when, when and if and, and it looks like they're planning. I saw the press conference on that. 
So if they're planning to come back and we expect them to come back whenever it is, you can just see council and revenues adjusting again their projections for the future. So it really comes down to that. I think that what the Hart staff has done a very good job of is they've done a good job of controlling costs as much as they can. In other words, you know, how they're building. Remember, Yunji and Ryan, we're talking about the last four miles. That's what we're talking about. And if you take out the, 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 the Ala Moana to Civic Center, it's the last three miles of this project. That's what we're discussing now. That's what we're pretty sure you'll get to that point. And I am somewhat con confident that we can probably go all the way. It's, it's going to be a matter of how the economy picks up, but we have to do a, a really a, a snapshot in time right now to do that projection. And that's what Civic Center is. And, and when, and just just to follow up on that, when do you think that projection is made? Because if you're saying the FDA does approve this end at Civic Center, and, and mm -hmm. so we get to that point, uh, and then we look at that point in time to see what the economy looks like, what projections look like, are, are you saying that we would wait till we get to Civic Center and then begin that conversation to Alamana? Or is that conversations that are simultaneously happening, say, two years maybe before the end, uh, you know, if it's 28 uh, when you decide just begin looking at that last leg to Ala Moana. Ryan, you know, I think what we are all mixing up here is the role of the federal government. So, you know, if we, if we were to look at this project as federalized and non-federalized, in other words, a part that the federal government is putting in its money and the part that the federal government is not putting in its money, then you can look at the leg from Civic Center to Ala Moana as the non-federalized one. So that discussion can continue. It just means we don't get the federal monies to, to finish that one leg or the two legs, if you want to call it that, but it's that one mile, 1.25 miles to be exact. We're not looking at that. But that conversation can go on without the feds. You know, uh, I've been critical of the fact that I said, you know, we, we've only gotten basically $800 million from the federal government. When we started this project, it was supposed to be like 30% when it happened and when the idea came about and we did the 26, 2012 is when the full funding grant agreement was entered into. But we've been talking about rail since 2007. That's when in 2006 is when the legislature, legislature enacted the first GET. So when you, when, you, when you start, then you think about it. When we started at 4.9 construction costs, 5.2 including uh, financing costs in 2012, and that's $1.55 million billion dollars total. And now you look at this project and it's going to probably be close to $10 billion when we're, we're, if we get to Pacific Center. You know, so you're, you're, you're asked, I'm saying at what point does a 0.8, I mean, an 8% of the contribution then dictate everything. And so this is why I think we're at a good place with the feds. The federalized portion, they would have great a lot of say in, but the non-federalized portion is up to us, the people, and what we believe in. So the question is going to be, assuming, and I believe that we will have a surplus to Civic Center, so we have that surplus to Civic Center. How much more do we need and what are the people willing to do? And I will represent to you that as far as I know right now, as we sit here today, no one has looked at bonding the, the TAT money that we're getting in perpetuity, which is, as you know, about going to be one and a half percent in a couple of years. So if it's about a billion dollars, give or take, to get to Ala Moana, will the people not then say, hey, finish it. And I can tell you, once the mayor made his announcement, I had so many people come up to me and say, it's only 1.25 miles. Can't you guys figure out how to get there? Because people want to go to Ala Moana. They may not think of Ala Moana as a transit stop, but they think of Ala Moana as Ala Moana. So, you know, that's what people are looking at. What Civic Center offers that I think that a lot of people have not given consideration to, it's, it's probably a more effective a transit stop, a transit station. 
We've got more land there. Mother Walpin Park is there, for example. There's a lot more city land in there that would help us build out uh, a, a transit station. And I tell people, look how easy it would be to get on the freeway if you're going to UH or you're going the other way, any place else, because you can get on at Ward, you can get on at uh, uh, at Pecoy, you can get on any place. And from South Street, think about how easy that is in access to Waikiki. You don't have to go through Ala Moana and go down Atkinson or whichever way and go. Just go down Ala Moana. So I think that there's... There is value and merits in how we look at it. But the most important thing is when rail starts to run, which we hope to see by the last quarter of this year, September, October, when it's actually running, I think that it's going to make a great deal of difference when people can get on it, they can ride it, and they can see, hey, this isn't bad. This is pretty convenient. Well, that's what I want to ask you. We were focusing a lot on the the end of the route, but let's talk about what's already done. Lori Kahikina has said that they do intend to turn over a portion of the route to the city uh, for perhaps ridership. That's up to the mayor, um, at least perhaps to the stadium and in that area. What are your thoughts on when people will actually be able to start riding this train from what you've what you've seen? Well, you know, we've um, we've had a report from Laurie and her group, and and we do know, for example, everyone when kind of gasped when you heard about the frogs. People didn't know what frogs were before, other than those creepy, creepy creatures. And then and then you so you heard about the gauge, and you know they're they're all basically rail. Uh, the representation that's been made to us is that it's all pile now. They've taken care of that. Luckily, it was not as bad as we expected. So we could do it without extra welding or anything major going on. So with that, I would, I'm hopeful that they will be able to, and you know, Hitachi plays in this as well, because what people may not realize is Hitachi is the contractor, we call the core contractor, which is the one that does the actual rails and the, you know, and, and the operations part for at least five years anyway. So when, so when you look at that and they're, they get ready, then the people of the city and county of Honolulu in 2016 turned over the operations and maintenance of the project to the Department of Transportation Services. So they have to decide and they, they're testing for safety for like 90 days. Everything has to go smoothly for 90 days. So hoping that all of that works. I think September, October may be a realistic estimate as to when people can board in uh, what do we call East Kapolei? I call it the uh, the the Croc Center <laughs> location, all the way to Aloha Stadium. They'll be able to do that, and you know, and from there there'll be a transit location as well, and people can get on and off the buses. So I think that once people get to that point, even if it's just out of curiosity and getting on and going, turning around and going back, it's it's going to make all the difference especially I'm counting on the next next two generations, the children who are probably going to think, wow, this is, this is amazing. I've always built a belief that rail transit uh, and the rail system and the transit oriented developments is a statement of how the future generations are probably going to move in terms of transporting themselves, but also in terms of how they're going to live. You know, if you are in Washington, D.C., you can see the, you know, the, the millennials don't buy cars. They're all, and if they're going to use a car, they use, I guess what we call it here is Hulu, but if there is Zip and whatever else, and you just use the car for whenever you use it, and you park it wherever, and you tell them, go, go get it. That's a different kind of lifestyle. And I think that many of the people who criticize rail, are not thinking about the generation that we all claim we're building it for and how they view it. And that's where I think it's gonna make a difference. And as people see it and people realize that it, it represents a change in lifestyle and how we are all viewing the future. And if we are viewing the future for the future generation, then you know what? Talk to them, ask them, how do you wanna live? I would guess many of them 
kind of like COVID because they get to work at home. And that whole thing about working at home or teleworking, however you want to call it. But they also like the fact that they can be so independent of things like, for example, uh, car payments, insurance, parking costs, so forth. I know in D.C., that's a major thing. They don't want to be, some of them have told me very bluntly, we don't want to be a slave to a mortgage. We don't want to be a slave to car payments. We want to be free and do what we want. And, you know, listen to them. And then plan and build accordingly. You know, we want to move on here and talk a little bit about Lori Kahikina and, and the role that she has done thus far, serving in the capacity of taking over as CEO of this organization mm -hmm. and having to lead this. Uh, your thoughts with the way that she has done? You know, she's also publicly said that she's not going to be taking that bonus that was due to her. Uh, how do you, how has your relationship been with uh, Lori and, and how confident are you that she's the person to help lead and continue to lead this project? I think that uh, the board has taken a statement, made a statement where we unanimously gave her uh, a contract because she's been interim up until now. Uh, it's a two-year contract, well, a three-year contract with the third year being subject to board approval. Uh, and that's because, you know, we don't know what will happen. Uh, in the long run. So we, we wanted to have that option. I think that what, um, and one of my colleagues on the board has said this, he said the, that the difference when he watches what's going on with, with Laurie is that Laurie has a very active board. So I'm very confident that because of the role that the board plays and the candor with which she has run hard, and she's been very transparent and candid about it, and she's answered all of our hard questions and the fact that we are able to work out the differences that we may have. And we're gonna have differences. You know, I've got 14 pe potential people on the board and they all have questions and they all have opinions. I think that when you, when you look at that in the long run, I think we will be able to collectively, and we have a very supportive mayor and you know, we have uh, the chair of the city council who's also been an integral part of of our discussions. I think when you look at that dynamic, I think it will be a success because we have all the major components, maybe not necessarily always lock stock uh, between us, but but willing to work for the benefit of the people, the city county of Honolulu, and more importantly than that, uh, for, the, for the project, as it may serve the people of the city and county of Honolulu. So I think that as long as we all keep in mind and realize what our objectives are and what the long-term goal is. And the long-term goal, as one of my other colleagues would say, is to get to UH Manoa. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, by doing this truncated project, I think that the, the from Ala Moana to UH can possibly qualify for another set of federal fundings because it would be considered a, it could qualify, I think, for another new start funding. So that, and it's going to be, to me, not as difficult because it's supposed to go down Kapiolani and some people feel we should go down King Street instead. There's more room, whatever it may be. That I think is something that, that can be looked at in the future. But for what, right now, we are looking to um, truncate the project, uh, not end it and not stop it at Civic Center, which is Kali Kawila and South. And I believe that the people should keep their, um, keep us all, keep all of our feet to the fire and realize that we can, independent of the feds, we don't need the feds to, with all due respect to the feds, because they still haven't given us the money. So <laughs> don't disrespect uh, to go from, um, to go from Civic Center to Alamona, 1.25 miles. You've got some fans here in the comments, and so I got to bring these in. Heidi says, Aloha, is it Hanabusa time? The election is nearing. <laughs> and Marie saying, Governor or Congress, which race Hanabusa time? So I got to ask you, uh, there have been some rumblings that Kai Kahele could vacate his seat and run for governor. Would you be interested in heading back to Washington if that scenario does play out? You know, I have been asked that question so many times. And I think the Hanabusa time people, Donald and Dela Cruz should assess them a royalty because <laughs> I think that was one of her, her gridiron skits. But, you know, it's I've always been interested in serving 
Uh, and part of service is also knowing when it's time to help the next generation on. But, you know, they say never say never. And it would all depend on things like uh, what what's going on for us here. What does it look like? How will it aid or not aid the, the state and the people of Congressional District 2, which I've always, um, as you know, I'm from Waianae, so that's solid Congressional District 2. And uh, in the governor's race, um, I've had uh, great support from CD2. So I feel an obligation to, to serve in the best way that I can. But right now, I would have to say, I got uh, a major project with with uh, the rail and trying to get this whole thing through. We've got a rest recovery plan that's got to be approved by and to the feds by June 30th. I have a pig that's worked so hard. It sounds terrible, but it really is a, a nice way of being able to discuss things in a permitted interaction group without violating Sunshine Law. So, you know, I, I, I want to see these projects through and to make sure that we are on course. When I took on going on the board and then becoming its chair, uh, you know, that's it's part of my DNA that I'm just going to put everything in it. So maybe ask me after it's all over, <laughs> after we get a recovery plan through and get the um, FTA to uh, graciously agree to give us some of our money, uh, I, then ask me. <laughs> well, what's the filing deadline, Ryan? <laughs> it's June. <laughs> it's June. <laughs> okay. I think it's okay. June. So it's not that. I mean, that's not a no. <laughs> no, it's, it's never a no. They tell you never say no. Because <laughs> then that's going to come at every ad that you do if you decide to run. So, no, you never say no. You never say no. You just, you know, but I, I, I got to tell you, I mean, right now I have my, uh, I, I believe that when I took this project on, to be on the board and then to become its chair, that is my obligation. But I will also say that I've told the board that we are going to follow our rules. So in June, we will, we will open it up for a new chair and a new vice chair, if that's the inclination of the board. So we'll see. All right. Well, we appreciate the update, uh, not only on your political future, but of course, on the rail, uh, and where we're at. Uh, I, uh, we do really do uh, always enjoy speaking with you and getting an insight on what's happening with the whole project as a whole and, and look forward to having more discussions with you in the future. Always great to see you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Aloha. 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 Well, interesting to note there, you heard uh, Colleen Hanabusa, the Heart Board Chair, talk about how this is not, uh, Holly Kawila and South Street is not the final destination. She called this a truncated route. This is really just for now. And as important as she did say those federal dollars are, she did note that as the cost of the project has increased, the percentage of their influence has obviously decreased. And so what we were looking at uh, when this project first started was a substantial percentage, and now less than 10% of the funding would come from the feds. And so she says that the people of Hawaii should have a bigger say and should not necessarily be dictated purely by federal decisions as to where the route should end. And we've seen how funding mechanisms for this project has changed over time. Of course, the recent change to what she dubbed as the city TAT now with that percentage of dollars that will be coming in in just a few years that will be dedicated to this project will also play into how far this actually goes as you said she thinks that this is a uh, this truncated plan to go to south street and halikawila would not necessarily mean the end uh, but rather uh, looking at ways where they can finish that 1.2 miles as she repeatedly said really making it clear that they recognize that it is not that far of course, from Kaka'ako to Ala Moana. And that could be a portion that was actually done with money that is raised within the state or through the project itself, rather than having to rely on the federal government for that last sector of a line. And also noting that the ultimate goal still is potentially to go to the University of Hawaii, which was the initial, uh, when this project was first conceptualized and brought to the public, that was the end goal was getting uh, residents on that west side out to universe the university of hawaii manoa and so there are sort of segments to this project as we've seen throughout uh, and one of those segments will also be riders being able to enjoy the rail for the first time as soon as this year
Yeah, that was very interesting to note. She said a lot of the physical issues that we had been talking about in the past, these frogs and the and everything not fitting together in the way that it should, that that is really being ironed out and that she anticipates being able to actually ride the rail sometime September or October. And she's saying that once people actually get on that train and experience that, she thinks that uh, public view of pr public perception of this project will change dramatically. So and then, of course, Ryan, uh, we, we you know, we have to note that she did didn't say no. She didn't say yes. She always likes to keep it open. Um, and she did note that she does have roots in CD2. Of course, she uh, did not represent that district in the past, but that she uh, has always talked about uh, in all of her political campaigns, the importance of YNI to her, to her family growing up. And, and you heard her there echo that again. Yeah. And, but again, we do not know what is <laughs> happening in that race. There's a lot of people in the community saying, will he or won't he? Uh, we still do not know what plans uh, Representative Kai Kahele has for that seat and what he plans to do. But we'll just have to wait and see in what could be a very crazy political <laughs> season or the end of this political season as we head on into the elections. That's right. On Monday, we are sticking with politics. We'll be talking with Governor David Ige. Uh, we had a very in interesting discussion, if you missed it, with Donovan Dela Cruz and Sylvia Luke earlier this week talking about the budget. We'd love to get his reaction to their proposal to give a pretty substantial tax break. Uh, you know, he had proposed $100 per resident. Uh, now they are saying uh, $300 for those earning less than $100,000 a year. So tripling that benefit. What are his thoughts on that and the rest of the legislative session? Of course, COVID and tourism, there's always plenty to talk about with Governor Ige. We hope you do join us right back here Monday at 1030. We'll see you then. Have a great weekend. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.